we see whether see whether people get anything see whether people get anything out of it out of it it's uh, it's a bit less quantitative but i think it's important so i'm going to talk about errors of interpretation or type 6 errors as you'll you'll see they can also be described as um i have various hats i ha i have a data science company that does software and consulting and i'm a visiting professor in the maths department and the chief data scientist at the smart data foundry which is a nonprofit owned by edinburgh university um and oh and Clicking is not doing anything. And as Rowan said, I've I've been pushing for ab about seven years now that or developing this idea of test-driven data analysis, which is a lot like reproducibility, but with slightly more of a focus on automated testing. And, and the sort of worldview it starts from is that most analysis that we do uh, has two phases, a development phase and a deployment phase. And during the development phase uh, for analysis, any, any kind of data analysis, uh, you almost always develop the analysis in the context of some concrete data set, some specific set of data that you want to calculate some result on or, or, or produce some understanding of. And various things can go wrong. And in that development phase, the two most obvious things are you can fail to understand the data or you can fail to understand the problem domain, or you, or you can fail to understand the applicability of methods. And I, I call those errors of interpretation. Uh, and then even more obviously, as you develop your analysis, whether that's you know in Excel or in R or in Python or whatever, you can make coding mistakes. Uh, and those are bugs, but I, I tend to call those errors of interpretation. And the key thing is that you only, you only get the right answer if you don't make uh, bad mistakes in either of those places. It's, it's kind of obvious. And that used to be how a lot of analysis ended, but these days we almost always have some kind of operational phase where we now want to push new data through either an automated pipeline that we're running all the time, or we want to uh, you know, run new data through it by hand. And that brings a whole new set of opportunities for things to go wrong. We can use the software incorrectly, errors of process, um, or very importantly, there can be a mismatch between uh, the development data and the data we're pushing through, or the assumptions that we've made uh, when we're building our modeling on the basis of the deployment data. And those are those are areas of applicability, as I call them. And then at the end, uh, either we or someone else can, of course, misinterpret our results. So we get another kind of error of interpretation. Uh, and it's only if we avoid all those things that our first run through uh, is, is going to be correct. Uh, and to make things even worse, uh, when we have this operational setup, we we typically run this part of the pipeline many times. So there are lots of opportunities for things to go wrong. Now, in, in TDDA, which is a, uh, a Python library that I, I maintain, an open source library, and also a, a set of ideas, uh, we've, we've kind of tried to tackle most of the areas of this. So errors of process and errors of applicability. Uh, we've developed stuff for using constraints to check input and output data, and indeed to discover suitable constraints for checking from example input and output data, uh, which is quite powerful and which we use all the time uh, in all the work I do. Um, and we've developed extensions to standard testing libraries that make testing easier when you have the sorts of complex outputs that uh, are typical in data science where the results are not necessarily identical every time. And I don't mean that's because of seeds or because of numerical rounding or parallelism or anything like that. I mean more because, you know, they tend to embed versions and date stamps and things get deserialized in different orders. So there are lots of things that can make the files different, even when the semantic content of the output is identical. So there's support in the library for that. What I haven't really talked about much before, uh, or at least not systematically, is errors of interpretation. What can we do about those? Is there anything we can do about those. Um, and so, as I say, test room data analysis, it's, it's kind of like reproducibility, but it's, I guess it comes slightly more from the software end of things. And the idea is we're trying to produce stuff that's helpful, even if no one's trying to reproduce your data, even if it's uh, your, your results, even if it's just you. So that's kind of the setup. Um, and one of the things I've maintained for years is that data scientists should take some kind of equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. In fact, the Hippocratic Oath itself would be fine. First, do no harm. Uh, and there's a sort of large sense of that, which is really the most important one, which is, you know, depending on your morality, try not to cause climate change, try not to kill people, try not to discriminate against people, whatever. But those are different for different people. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on a smaller sense of first do no harm, which is let's really try at least to get the right answers. 
And let's take responsibility for trying to minimize the chances that someone's going to fundamentally misinterpret those answers, which is really the kind of error of interpretation I'm concentrating on today. And, and that person can be us or it can be someone else. So some famous examples of, of uh, errors of interpretation. Some of you, we, we had someone from NASA speaking earlier, great talk. Um, the Mars Climate Orbiter was a $350 million uh, dollar mission that was lost. And it was lost because NASA worked in SI units, as all sensible scientists do, and their contractor Lockheed Martin worked in Imperial units in foot pound seconds. And so when the Lockheed Martin system reported back the uh, the impulse that, that the engines had produced, it reported it back in pounds for seconds, and it was interpreted by NASA's. Uh, software as being in newton seconds there's a factor of about five and a half difference and that costs 350 million dollars um when we report our results we have to take responsibility for, for trying to make sure that people understand them we use all sorts of crazy units and we use the same abbreviations for different things so is you know is m meters or miles or milli or million is a big one a big m you know a thousand or 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 or, or two m's a million or or there are all sorts of things that are the K's, there are the English billions versus the US billions, you know, is 90 degrees pi by two or alcohol that's that's 45%, sorry, a, a drink that's 45% strong, or is it nearly boiling point if you're working in Celsius, or, or, or does it just mean you need to wear sunscreen? Also, and you don't even get me started on calories versus kilocalories, which are calories with a capital C and points and pints and all these kinds of things. So we have to be clear when we communicate these, these things. Um, Another very familiar example of, of errors inter of interpretation that are important, when we're doing discrimination problems, when we're predicting a binary outcome, it's super important to communicate which class we're predicting. So if the airline safety system says 99.9983%, I really want to know, I really care about whether that's the probability that the plane's going to have a successful and safe flight, or it's the probability that's going to crash. It's going to affect a real world decision I'm going to make. Um, regression to the mean, probably the, the, the most important kind of error I see on a really regular basis. I, I suspect almost everyone here, if not everyone knows what regression to the mean is, and I don't have time to explain it in detail, if not, but broadly regression to the mean occurs when you take some kind of a measurement of some population like income or, or activity or something, and you, you treat the, you, you segment your population on the basis of that and look at how it changes over time. So you take the people who are on high incomes and the people on low incomes and the people on medium incomes. And what you tend to find is that the lines will come together. And that doesn't mean that society is getting more equal or anything. It just means that the people at the bottom are more likely to increase because they haven't got very far to go down. And the people at the top well, maybe with income, this is less, but they, they're sort of more likely to come down than go up because there's, at least in principle, less chance for them to go up, whereas people in the middle move in both directions, so they cancel out. But you see people interpreting and over-interpreting these graphs as if there's something real going on when there just isn't, because it's it's just a systematic effect of this kind of analysis. Um, type 1 and type 2 errors. Um, no one knows which type 1 errors are and which type 2 are. Some people think they do, and some people know some other time, but no one remembers it all the time. Uh, Randall Munro, the, the author of XKCD, of course, also introduced some more errors for you. And although it was after I started talking about errors of interpretation, in particular, he introduced type 6 errors, correct result, which you interpret wrong, which is the subtitle of this talk. Um, I'd also make the point that even the terms false positive and false negative are problematical because for many kinds of things, it's not super clear which is the positive and which is the negative outcome. So again, we have to be careful to explain these things. Um, ah, yeah, I just thought I'd put this this uh, this datum up for you all to contemplate for a moment. And if you want to, you can you can place bets on uh, what that data item represents every every data scientist's favorite um significant figures and spurious precision spurious precision was mentioned earlier today as well um many years ago about 30 years ago um i wrote a book i don't think i can move this thing that's in the way but maybe i can no i don't think i can um uh, i wrote a book with a friend tony clayton uh on sustainability we had this crazy notion that the planet was in trouble um look how silly we were 
Uh, and the table that he wanted to put in illustrated the amount of water that was on the earth in different forms. And so he, he listed the amounts of fresh water, the amount in clouds, about 20,000 cubic kilometers, the amount of continental water in rivers and things, which was about 9 million cubic kilometers, the amount of ice, which was then about 30 million kilometers. It's quite a lot less than that now. Uh, and the amount in oceans, which was about 1.3 billion kilometers. And then the total that he wanted to write was, you know, 1 billion, 339 million and and uh, 20,000 cubic kilometers. And I refuse to put that table in because as I'm sure you've all spotted, uh, every digit in that final row comes from a different part of the data. Of course, the 1.3 billion uh, cubic kilometers of, of water in the oceans is not that to six significant figures. So you can't possibly add 20,000 kilometers to it and get a meaningful result. So what we ended up doing, which is not perfect, but I think was better, uh, was we put what should have been CDOT, but CDOT in as the total, and we explained in the text why we'd done that. And Tony's objection to that was, uh, if we do that, people will write and say, we've got the sums wrong. And it turns out Tony was exactly right. Four people wrote in to tell us that we got the sums wrong. But I still feel that's a fairer representation of the data than, than that. Um, I'm just kind of listing through a few things. We'll, we'll get to the final one in a minute. Um, percentage change is always problematical. Again, I'm sure everyone here knows this, but if something goes from 1% to 1.1%, what is the increase? Obviously, geometrically, multiplicatively, it's 10% increase because 1.1 is 10% bigger than 1, but it's a 0.1 percentage point increase. That's what the point in percentage point means. Unfortunately, there's no standard way of writing that. I tend to use PP, other people use uh, percent PT, other people still use, um, well, actually various other various other things, but it's it's super important to understand the difference. Sometimes called relative versus absolute risk if it's a risk that you're measuring. And finally, we get to graphs, or charts. Um, there's, a, there's a very good website, Junk Charts, you might enjoy. Um, I'm just going to state my views on these things. These are all just bits of guidance, even though I'm going to state them as absolute rules. Um, never, ever, ever, ever use dual axis charts. Um, almost never use non-uniform scales except for log scales. And if you are using log scales, be very careful to uh, put the grid lines on that let you see that they're log. Be super careful about using false zeros on charts, i.e. not putting the zero in if zero actually means zero. If zero is arbitrary, like on the Celsius or the Fahrenheit scale, it's fine not to put it at zero. But if it's a real zero, like absolute zero, uh, you need to put it in. Um, same thing applies if you're doing color maps, choropleths. Um, try not to use area and volume to show things because people are terrible at understanding areas and volumes. Um, don't invert your charts. You'll see what I'm talking about there later. Try and avoid Bezos charts. Bezos charts, for people who haven't come across them, are the charts that Jeff Bezos liked at Amazon, which have no numbers but just show a directional change. Obviously, try to avoid unclear labels and unclear tick labels and to miss off units and be super careful about putting lines of best fit on graphs, especially if they're questionable and have too many degrees of freedom. So that's the, that's the glass half empty version. Glass half full is what, what do we want to do? Well, we want to annotate graphs carefully. Um, Edward Tufte, a great writer on, on graphing and visualization and stats generally, talks about maximizing data and can minimizing chart junk, which is to say, when you put ink on a page to draw a graph, as much of it as possible should represent data, and as little of it as possible should represent all the other stuff, the you know the axes and the grid lines and, and all that kind of stuff. Definitely 3D artifacts. Um, use direct labeling where possible, so try not to make people move across and look at a legend to understand what something is if you put the label right on the data. Um, put error bars on where they're appropriate and, and explain what the error bars mean. Uh, somewhere I disagree with Tufty. Uh, I think pie charts are just fine as long as you're just uh, just showing things that add up to 100%. Um, put units on things. If you do want to pull out some detail that doesn't really show up on the full scale, then use a zoom. You know, draw a circle around the bit and and pull out what you want to show because at least then it puts it in context. Um, and use broken axes where required. Um, Oh, to go back to my earlier example, as I'm sure you all all used, I uh, I printed the date 21, uh, 2nd of December 2101 in the format percent Y percent D percent M. Uh, anyone who lived through 2000 has the year 2000 bug has no excuse for using six digit dates and people who grow up afterwards hopefully learn that ISO 8601 is the, the way to go YYYYMMDD. 
Um, two of my favorite charts to finish with. Uh, many of you will have seen this recently, I suspect. This chart, as you will clearly see, uh, a dual axis chart, shows China's defense spending, which you'll clearly see is about $250 billion using the scale on the left, and the US defense spending, which you clearly see is three times that at just under $800 billion. Um, and the very best chart I've ever seen, I think, probably comes from gun deaths in Florida uh, after their stand your ground law, as you can clearly see, the effect of the stand your ground law was a massive increase in gun deaths. Um, I'm not sure why they chose to, to draw the chart that way out. So that's me whitt um, whittering on about errors of interpretation. I hope you got, I'm not, I know most of you will have known most of those things and will probably disagree with some of them, but hopefully there was, uh, there was something in there to start to talk about what we can do to avoid errors of interpretation.